University for Florida Gainesville, uh, Florida University. And um, Desiree has a, has a very um, interesting sort of background. She's uh, served in the military for a couple of years, cybersecurity involved in like sensitive sites. Uh, and uh, then she decided to do psychology, uh, <laughs> because why not? And um, uh, in cognitive neuroscience, developmental cognitive neuroscience, but really she studies about many things. She, she worked with children, as well as more elderly participants, and we're going to talk about, uh, are you going to present your Parkinson's data? No, so I'm not presenting the Parkinson's okay. data today. Which is even presenting the pain data yeah. today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's the pain that I, okay, so that, that's great. So she has a general interest working in, you know, biomarker, neuroimaging, and clinical populations. So uh, thanks for coming and looking forward to your talk. Absolutely, thank you for having me today. Um, so today uh, I am going to be discussing pain and aging and um, the uh, brain structure involved in that and the potential effects of oxytocin on that brain structure. And so we'll start out with a brief background. Why is this important? Um, some of the structural markers of chronic pain in the aging brain specifically. And then we'll discuss whether or not intranasal oxytocin is a viable option for the management of chronic pain in older adults before concluding with some future directions for the work, um, future directions for my work potentially, and then also uh, questions. All right, so background, why is this important? So older adults are disproportionately affected by chronic pain. The average onset of chronic pain diagnosis is of 51 years old, which is still in middle age, but the uh, proportion of older, older adults, adults that are actually bothered by chronic pain is about one third, with uh, one out of five has remained uh, reporting a significant impact on their daily life activities. And so, um, chronic pain is uh, very non-adaptive. So we have a distinction between acute and chronic pain. And acute pain tells us, all right, there is a potentially dangerous stimulus and we need to back away from it. We can hurt you. Um, but chronic pain is generally non-adaptive. And sometimes it still continues in the absence of the, of the acute injury. Now, a lot of these areas uh, involved in pain processing, um, the, uh, some of the nociceptive regions here, but then also um, the limbic system and basal ganglia. Thank you. <laughs> The limbic system and basal ganglia also play a major role in pain processing. And as a matter of fact, after subacute injury, what tends to occur in those individuals whose pain becomes chronic, the processing regions shift from the somatosensory uh, regions and motor regions to being more um, to being uh, more highly processed by the limbic and basal ganglia systems. So. Um, and in conjunction with this, there are changes that occur with chronic pain. And these are found, again, uh, in these uh, somatosensory and motor regions, but also in the brainstem, the prefrontal cortex, insula, spina cortices. So there's widespread changes in the brain as a result of chronic pain. Um, in addition to this, there are changes within the basal ganglia, thalamus, hippocampus, so all over. Um, and these changes in structure are not seen in individuals who habituate to chronic pain. So what can happen is that there is an injury and some people, or there's a continued chronic pain stimulus, some people will show these changes and will show this shift of processing to the limbic regions. However, other individuals will habituate to it, they will, um, will not pay as much attention to it, and it doesn't seem to have as much of an impact on their daily lives. And so the changes do not occur in those individuals. Um, and so we don't really know what the difference is between the individuals that habituate and those that are susceptible, but there are a couple studies to suggest that white matter integrity prior to injury may play a role. And the interesting thing is what happens when we alleviate the pain is 
that the brain structure normalizes. So this is whether it's through surgery or um, even in an instance where the pain was experimentally induced. Once the painful stimulus was removed, the brain structure later normalized. So um, what are some of the structural markers of chronic pain in the aging brain? So this is something that we kind of want to look at because what has occurred is that a lot of times these sample sizes are very general in their age range or they're comparing older brains to younger healthy controls. And the problem with that is that um, there's going to be these age-related changes in regions that process pain anyway. And so are we actually looking at pain or are we actually looking at um, aging? So what we did, um, and this is a much larger study that uh, I worked with Dr. Cruz Almeida, who's one of my mentors um, on, and it would be neuromodulatory examination of pain, mobility across life cycle. It's very long since so short hands to fall. But we have a sample size of about 52 older individuals with their age ranges from 60 to 93 years old and predominantly female, with the pain ranges being from no pain to severe chronic pain. So we can really take a look at um, within a relatively normal population with pain, uh, relatively healthy population with pain, what are we seeing in older adults? Um, and then we also Using pre test load codes as a Chiba scanner with a WG channel head coil. Um, we took a T1 weighted MT range and then a 64 direction diffused, diffusion weighted range for each of these. Um, in addition to this, we had some self report clinical measures. Uh, the one that we're going to be focusing on here is the global chronic pain scale and their ratings of pain intensity. And then we also decided to take a look and focus specifically on the basal ganglia volume. And um, then in addition to this, look at um, some of the white matter fiber tracts that are um, believed to be related to pain or related to regions involved in pain processing. So to do this, and this is part of the pipeline that we developed, um, which was discussed earlier, uh, we used uh, Freecursor 6.0 to segment and then use a modified Trachula pipeline in order to accommodate the 64 direction BWI. Um, <coughs> and then we construct the diffusion sensor pathways. And all of the scripts for this are up on the GitHub here. And um, everything is processed on the UF supercomputer. So um, what we found within the um, basal ganglia structures was that there seemed to be some association with chronic pain intensity um, with decrease in the putamen and caudate, but an increase in accumbens volumes. Uh, and while these associations existed, they weren't quite as strong as we had anticipated. However, um, when it came to uh, looking at fractional anisotropy in the white matter fiber tracts, specifically the anterior thalamic, uh, thalamic radiation and the cortical spinal tract, we did see that there seemed to be, um, in the regression analysis, there seemed to be a very strong connection between the uh, severity of the pain that these individuals were experiencing and the um, F8 in those tracks. And so um, some of the questions that we had then is, um, you know, how do we help these individuals? How do we help older adults? And so when we take a look at some of the current treatments for chronic pain, yes? Yeah, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but uh, could you describe uh, really quickly what Dracula does because you know I'm, I'm not familiar with oh. that particular pipeline. Yes. And so I can go. I'm not quite sure what you're showing us here. Okay, so I can go back a little bit. So what Dracula does, um, and uh, what I changed were the earlier steps, which was basically I um, used a different instead of MRI convert, I used um, MRI crons uh, DCMI to NIIX. Um, to convert and then had to correct these using um, 
FSL and the eddy current um, subject motion correction using FSL and then um, the BVEC rotation to adjust to the V1, uh, new V1 vector orientation and then we sent it to um, the, back to the trachea pipeline which then did a co-registration of the DWI image with the um, parcellated T1 um, and then it uh, creates these cortical white matter and anatomical masks um, from the subject parcellations and then co-registers the masks and the previous registrations. After that, um, it fits it to the uh, running FSL's DTI fit. It fits the diffusion tensors to the eddy corrected data. And then we ran, um, and then I ran uh, bed post X uh, from FSL on that to obtain the Bayesian estimation of diffusion parameters, obtain usually sampling techniques with crossing fibers, and then after that, pass it back to Tracula for pathway priors estimation, um, and then on to Tracula again for the pathway reconstruction. So you get tracks? Yes, so you get tracks. And then how do you analyze the FA on those tracks? I so what the <laughs> what the um, <laughs> what Tracula the output that Tracula produces is um, it gives you um, the by subject output of FA MD um, and uh, it gives you the by subject output um, with the specific values that it's measured at the different points. So it gives you the coordinates that it used, um, and then it gives you the values per subject per coordinate for each of these tracks and for each of these. And so what we did was for the individual subjects for their FA, um, we uh, took the average uh, FA for that given tract for that given subject. And so that's what we used. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you show a map, we really you do a single test for the entirety of the tract? Yes. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a statistic for each voxel in the brain. It's really overall for that particular tract you saw an effect. Right, for that particular tract. So, um, and then we just selected those specific tracts that, that, we that we felt were related to pain because they were connected to the structures that we were interested in. And um, these are actual images from a single participant who... So that's just to illustrate the tracks, but the colors don't code for statistics. So right. You get right. one statistic for each of the tracks. Right, right. The original output has multiple, but then we average, average it out, right? It makes it uh, easier to evaluate, and then some individuals have shorter tracks than others. And so we want to make sure that we're accounting for that. Um, and so one th uh, thing that we needed to consider, because okay, we can look at these differences in um, in the brain, but um, how do we uh, help older adults with their pain? And what are the current treatment options first? Um, one is surgery, which of course naturally is invasive and not effective for everyone. Um, and then we have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. However, long-term chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can increase the risk for cardiovascular and intestinal problems, which older adults uh, are already somewhat prone to. And then um, there is the option of opiate pain relievers. However, these carry a high addiction risk and are recommended as a last resort. Um, and so, Again, kind of to summarize a section before we move on to the next, the older adult population is disproportionately affected by chronic pain, and chronic pain is associated with altered brain structure and age-affected regions. Um, however, older adults are more vulnerable to the adverse effects of current treatments, leading to the need for a low side effect chronic pain management option. And so um, one question that we wanted to ask is whether uh, intranasal oxytocin is a viable option for the management of chronic pain in older adults. And so one of the reasons that 
I was considering <coughs> oxytocin for chronic pain management was due to uh, the fact that oxytocin um, projects to regions of the brain that are also involved in pain processing. And so um, it includes the regions that we looked at, such as the nucleus accumbens, um, regions within the striatum, and uh, amygdala, hippocampus, brainstem, um, which is involved in pain modulation. And so uh, in addition to this, a recent study <coughs> also found, um, this is uh, one of the few that have looked at where oxytocin receptors are in the human brain, um, have found <coughs> that within some of these regions that are involved in pain processing, there are also oxytocin receptors. Um, and then in addition to this, um, the endogenous oxytocin system is related to brain structure. So oxytocin plasma levels, uh, which are um, not directly correlated with cerebral spinal fluid levels, but are a fairly decent indicator of uh, cerebral spinal fluid levels of oxytocin, have been found to negatively correlate with the uh, amygdala and uh, hippocampal volume and then positively correlate with the nucleus accumbens and hypothalamic gray matter volume. In addition to this, oxytocin receptor genotypes have been found to uh, be associated with uh, structural volumes, again, in these limbic system regions. And so <coughs> there is evidence that oxytocin modulates pain. Um, we know that blood plasma levels are altered in chronic pain and uh, in addition to this, in acute trials, it's been found that oxytocin in human trials has been able to attenuate pain perception um, when administered intranasally. However, there are only two clinical trials where chronic pain was investigated. Um, one was a single dose trial with uh, intractable pain in a patient with terminal cancer and it offered him relief for a brief period. And, but then in a three-week trial for women with fibromyalgia, they did not receive any benefit, although it's been hypothesized um, that the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories could have potentially interfered with oxytocin's effects on pain. Um, and so what we did in Dr. Uh, Natalie Abner's lab is we are currently conducting in four, a four-week intranasal oxytocin trial um, where we have approximately um, 40 male patients is what we're trying to collect with good data sets. Um, and we have 39 right now. They initially come in for a health evaluation and then um, do a series of study visits, including a pain and sensory testing, and then come in for an MRI visit um, if they qualify, where they receive a T1 weighted MP rage and a 64 direction diffusion weighted image. Then they will self administer uh, twice daily 24 international units of intranasal oxytocin for four weeks. Then they come back and go through everything again. And so um, we have not yet been unblinded to this uh, and will not be until data collection is complete, which should be fairly soon. But the hypotheses here are that um, four weeks of the 24 intranasal twice daily self-administration will um, increase the volumes of these striatal regions and decrease the accumbens compared to placebo, and also that um, it will affect the uh, FA within the frontal and thalamic fiber tracts as compared to placebo, and also that these changes will correlate with the changes in the characteristic pain intensity scores in intranasal oxytocin treatment group. And so, um, to kind of summarize this region, the large amount of overlap between the brain regions associated with pain processing and those which are potentially strong targets for intranasal oxytocin uh, seems to make this, um, in combination with oxytocin's ability to modulate pain, seem to make oxytocin a good candidate for the management of chronic pain in older adults. Although, um, we will see shortly. 
Um, and so some future directions for, for this work and some future directions that I to go. Um, and so uh, one thing that we also would like to potentially look at is individual variation as a predictor of clinical outcomes for older adults with chronic pain. So is does oxytocin work for all of these adults or only some of these adults and <coughs> why? Are there differences in brain structure that could potentially contribute to this? Um, and then also um, being able to uh, ensure that we're differentiating between changes in the brain that are part of normal aging versus changes that are pain related because there are uh, changes that are similar in both and we want to be sure that we're actually teasing those out and getting to those. Um, and so some future directions that um, that I would like to go would be connecting various modalities not just looking at brain structure but also looking at brain structure, functional connectivity, combining it with other, um, with other sorts of modalities in order to improve the sorts of biomarker characterization in neurodegenerative diseases and um, do so in the context of machine learning. And so thank you for, um, are there uh, any questions so far? Thank you. And especially right after lunch, it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. You can see who, who slept and who's not. Um. So for the other study, uh, unfortunately, the population in the area where the data was collected is not very diverse. So we're not able to, we don't have enough, um, enough ethnic variability within the sample to look into that with this population that we have there. Um, but there are indications that men and women may process differently, and then also that based on culture or ethnicity or genetics that there are variations in pain experience and how it's expressed. But unfortunately, the sample isn't enough that we can account for that. So you, you, you mentioned you want to, to try different modality. My understanding mm -hmm. is that here you look mostly at diffusion MRI. Yes. Have, have you also tried to include, say, some cortical sickness measurements from your free surfer pipeline? So we, um, we are looking at the structural volumes, but um, it's just within the basal ganglia, and we're probably going to expand those out because we have other measures as well. So we have the chronic pain intensity measure, um, but we also have measures of pain interference because that could also make a difference. And so with that and, the, uh, and what we've been looking at, it does appear that cortical thickness in the frontal regions appears to be more involved in, um, or appears to be more correlated with pain interference on an individual's life rather than uh, the basal ganglia structures which appears to be more related to the chronic pain. So. That is very... And you don't have fMRI in there? No, we don't have fMRI in there, unfortunately. So this Gosh. was... Um, yeah. <laughs> this study was uh, mostly a structural study that they wanted uh -huh. to do. And so we wanted to... <laughs> see? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there, um, within Dr. Cruz's lab, uh, there has been some resting state done with older adults in pain. and but that's still currently underway. <laughs> Did you observe any uh, structure, structure relationships so that your white matter tracks and brain regions? You know what, I had not looked at that, but as that is a really good idea. So I will take a look and see if there is, um, because that would definitely make sense. <laughs> 
uh, we don't have, uh, haven't used diffusion measure in the lab as a lot with uh, more like parameter ones, but with the fMRI it was a disappointment. It's not like a huge lot of, of overlap mm -hmm. of relationship between those measures. Uh, not as much as we would have anticipated. I know that, um, so we did a uh, study that we did with children several years ago where we were looking at children with dyslexia and dysgraphia. We did see a pretty strong correlation between functional connectivity and the DTI measures, so that might be another way to, to go. Well, yeah, I mean, for, for Alzheimer, we see that essentially well. Because the reason I asked is if, if, if the fact of principal of your cluster is volume differences connecting the region. That would make sense, and maybe trying to account for, for the right, effect of any other. Because we do see, in general, with aging, I mean, there are changes in, in tractography and tract integrity, so that would make sense. All right, was there any other pressing, pressing questions? I guess not. In any case, this year is still here for the afternoon, so if you want to meet with her. At a little point, please uh, come get us on the sixth floor. <laughs> and uh, otherwise, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, also, that's recording. That's our right. first. <laughs> <laughs> like, say thank you to my lab, also. <laughs> that helped me with the data collection. It's a nice way of, of, of wrapping that up. So, yeah. it's going to be on YouTube. So <laughs> check out the cream channel on YouTube. <laughs> now we've got <laughs> Congrats, you're hey, up Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>